next person we're going to bring up here is our constitutional expert. Now, I am biased because Ben and I have been friends since college. I am biased. Got me? I am biased. But I'm trying to remove that bias and tell you the best article in this magazine is written by Dave Benner. And you've got to read this thing. Uh, he's always good up here giving a speech, but his written form is even better. And he is actually writing a book on the Constitution. And I cannot wait to read this thing. Um, so without further ado, on the topic of the top anti-federalist apprehensions, Dave Benner. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Jack. I see the... Uh Snow banks are deeper than the federal debt as to explain why we don't have a completely packed house here today, but that's fine. Um, today I wanted to talk about an extremely important debate that took place in the very genesis of our republic, and that's the debate over whether the Constitution should be ratified or not. And believe it or not, that was a very contentious debate. Um, this thing was never sure to be ratified. In fact, in the big states, in the powerful states like Virginia and New York, it was extremely close um, with arguments on both sides. And the proponents of the Constitution are mostly called the Federalists today. Those are people that are more famous, like uh, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, James Wilson of Pennsylvania, and others. Um, on the other side were people like George Mason, who's sometimes known as the father of the Bill of Rights, and Patrick Henry, uh, Melanchthon Smith from New York, Luther Martin of Maryland, various uh, representatives that didn't feel that this was the right form and framework of government to adopt. And I wanted to talk about why that's the case. Um, I wanted to discuss some of the most common arguments that the anti-federalists, sometimes called the enemies of the Constitution or opponents of the Constitution, had about it. What apprehensions did they have? Well, you know, today we accept that this was a good model as part of you know, the Tea Party. The Constitution's a great thing, right? Well, not everyone thought that at the time. So I wanted to talk about the apprehensions that the Anti-Federalists had, and then how the Federalist supporters of the Constitution answered those claims. Uh, the first being that the document lacked a Bill of Rights. And this was most famously pronounced by Patrick Henry, perhaps the greatest orator who ever lived in this continent. Patrick Henry was known for his vitriol, his incredible spe uh, speaking ability. Um, this is a guy when Virginia debated in 1775 whether to submit its militia to help the cause for the War of Independence. He said, I know not the course that others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Um, earlier in his career, when he was basically chastised for his subversive mentality toward the British, he said, if this be treason, make the most of it. So this was a very incendiary individual, certainly deemed an extremist in his time. Anyways, he felt that a Bill of Rights was necessary, and that's one of the reasons he opposed the Constitution. He said, without a Bill of Rights, you will exhibit the most absurd things mankind uh, that the world, world ever saw, a government that has abandoned all its powers. And he was talking about Virginia at that point. Virginia would abandon all of its powers by signing this document. He further said that it would be without check, limitation, or control, referring to the federal government. Um, he said it would be pointed against the weak and prostrated and endeavored state governments, and it would be done in full and exclusive possession of all power. So without a Bill of Rights, how would the, the people have safeguards against the regulation forces of government to regulate people's rights? Um, well, I just wanted to discuss how that was answered by two of the most popular Federalist supporters of the Constitution, that being James Wilson of Pennsylvania and Alexander Hamilton of New York. So James Wilson was an incredibly influential individual you rarely hear about, but his writings and speeches were some of the, the best, uh, basically the best semantic arguments in support of the Constitution. Wilson said, for it would have been superfluous and absurd to have stipulated with a federal body of our own creation that we should enjoy those privileges of which we are not divested, either by the intention or the act that has brought the body into existence. So he's saying that it would be superfluous to have a Bill of Rights because we don't acknowledge that government has the ability to regulate such rights in the first place. The states won't divest that, those powers to the federal government. Alexander Hamilton, in turn, said, that bills of rights are not 
only unnecessary in the proposed Constitution, but would even be dangerous, says Alexander Hamilton. They would contain various exceptions to powers not granted and on this very account would afford a, col a colorful pretext to claim more than were granted. Where, when have we seen that in government before, by the way? For why we declare that things shall not be done which there is no power to do. So I stand here as someone who's no real great fan of Alexander Hamilton, but nonetheless I find this to be a particularly compelling argument. That how, how, can, we, how can we refute the fact that government, the federal government especially, has gone above and beyond to regulate the liberties, even those that are spelled out in the Bill of Rights. Every time that the government concocts free speech zones, that's a clear regulation of the First Amendment. Every time that politicians urge that we have to have a common sense debate on gun control, or want to define certain types of ammunition you can own, that's a complete regulation of the Second Amendment. Whenever uh, the government divests power within an institution to make a massive spy ring and determine what every citizen is doing, that's a complete violation of the Fourth Amendment. And, every, and any time that politicians supported NDAA 2012 and impeded due process rights, that's a complete violation of the Fifth Amendment. So Hamilton actually has a compelling argument here. So the Federalists are saying it's unnecessary. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is a claim that George Mason made in the Virginia Ratifying Convention. He said that the, the federal judiciary would be too powerful, right? And we've come to certainly understand this, especially in the last century. But he said there is no limitation. It goes to everything. The inferior courts are to be as numerous as Congress may think proper. They are to be of whatever nature they please. Now, John Marshall, who would become one of the most, well, de definitely the most influential chief Supreme Court justice, was actually part of the Virginia Ratification Convention. And he said that the objection which was made by the honorable member who was first up yesterday, yesterday, which was Mason, has not been so fully refuted that is, it is not worthwhile to notice it. So he was saying that really Mason has no po point in his argument. We've completely shattered the belief that the federal judiciary would become too popular. Ironically enough, I've already spoken here and I've spoken other places about how Chief Justice John Marshall expanded the courts greatly, the federal courts, assuming powers that were never imagined in the ratifying conventions. Um, George Mason was an incredibly influential individual that opposed the Constitution, known as the father of the Bill of Rights. He called himself a man of 1688, referring to the glorious revolution that overthrew a tyr tyrannical king and instituted Bill of Rights for England. Right? He wrote the Virginia Constitution, so his arguments had clout. They had uh, power behind them. The last claim I wanted to talk about is that Anti-Federalist opponents of the Constitution would sometimes say, and specifically in the Brutus writings, the Brutus writings are generally attributed to John Yates, a representative from New York, who left the convention earlier, uh, that before it was completed, believing that, you know, this thing's gotten out of control. We're no longer here to amend the Articles of Confederation. These nationalists are kind of making their own government model up. Well, he wrote that government is to possess absolute and uncontrollable powers, legislative, executive, and judicial, with respect to every object to which it extends. All that is reserved for the individual states must soon be annihilated. So that's pretty, pretty strong language there. In an old Whig writing, and the old Whig was an individual that was an anti-federalist writer in the state of Pennsylvania, he wrote, it is beyond a doubt that the new federal constitution, if adopted, will in great measure destroy, if not totally annihilate, the separate governments of the several states. So. You know, this was a powerful argument that these opponents of the Constitution were making, not only in one state, in multiple states. Um, just a picture on the slide there, Robert Yates is at the top. He's very underappreciated. This guy, his notes on the Federal Convention from the summer of 1787 were the first ones ever published. So people first got a sense of what took place there in Philadelphia by his notes. But he was an anti-federalist opponent. <coughs> So how did the Federalists dispute these claims? Well, Edmund Randolph, who was the first Attorney General of the United States and a representative from Virginia said, if I did believe with the honorable gentleman that all powers not expressly retained was given up by the people, I would detest this government. But I never thought so, nor do I now. So he's saying that's, that's garbage, that's hogwash, that's you know, an inappropriate argument. James Madison, you know, the father of the Constitution, right? He said, we shall be convinced that the general will 
never destroy the individual governments. So the general government won't work to subvert the state governments. Uh, Federalist 45, Madison makes this even more clear by saying that the powers delegated by the proposed Constitution are to be few and defined, whereas the powers which are to remain in the state governments are numerous and indefinite. So he recognized, and by, by the way, Madison favored a fairly nationalist view that didn't really win out in Philadelphia. Even he recognized that, wow, that the product of this document is actually pretty limiting on the general government. It only can do what Article 1, Section 8 enumerates that it can do. So, so there are other, other arguments that the Anti-Federalists proposed, some of which were that, you know, the delegates don't have the, the moral, social, or political authority to, you know, subvert the Articles of Confederation that they lived under for about 10 years. Um, some arguments were that um, the king would be, uh, the executive would be like a king. That he would exude the powers, not only that were uh, enumerated in Article 2 of the Constitution, but create his own powers, right? And then another argument was that, you know, the, the problems that these nationalist guys, you know, Hamilton and Madison were talking about, those are really actually exaggerations, and we actually don't need to rewrite the entire framework of our government. I mean, the reason for the Philadelphia Convention to be convened in the first place was just to make amendments to the Articles of Confederation. So there were other ar arguments that were made, but the big point kind of of my speech tonight is just to say that, you know, our government is defined by a very small subset of powers. And Thomas Jefferson wrote that we should understand the Constitution as it was supported by its advocates, not as how it was apprehended by its enemies. Jefferson said, I do then with sincere zeal wish an inviolable preservation of our present federal Constitution according to the true sense in which it was adopted by the states, that in which it was advocated by its friends and not which its enemies apprehended, who therefore became its enemies. Um, so, that being said, basically, we just have to understand that this argument was paramount because we had these, these opponents of the Constitution saying, you know, the, the Federalists are going to make this happen when the government comes into being as a result of the Constitution. They're going to ex exceed the powers that were granted. The judicial branch is going to grow. There's no Bill of Rights to protect the people's freedom, etc. And the Federalists, to a T, almost always said, no, you're wrong. We don't acknowledge that that's the case. But today we have people saying that, you know, we have a nationalist model of government. You know, because of the Constitution, we have to submit all sovereign powers of individuals, localities, municipalities, and the states to the federal government. Well, that's not true. And we need to be beacons of hope for those that would explain otherwise when, you know, called to do so. Um, our Constitution is a compact. In fact, Edmund Randolph referred to the Constitution of Virginia as 13 parties to a compact. A second Federalist in Virginia, George Nicholas, referred to it as 13 individuals to a compact. If you read the Constitution's text, states are always referred to in the plural. For instance, in Article 3, Section 3, when it talks about treason, it says that treason, treasons shall consist of levying war against them. In Article 1, Section 2, for instance, it talks about how elections are to be made in a manner that they shall be directed by law. So the states. Um, to sum this up today, we need to recognize that what happened in the state ratifying conventions is significant. We shouldn't acknowledge what judges or politicians say about the Constitution, you know, 220 years later if it, you know, refutes such things, if it acts to kind of subvert those opinions. That's the understanding that we have as part of our compact. And to leave you today, I just wanted to, you know, kind of reiterate that by quoting from my favorite president of the 20th century, Calvin Coolidge. One time, Coolidge had this to say, Our forefathers came to certain conclusions, which have been a great blessing to the world. Before we can understand their conclusions, we must go back and review the course which they followed. We must think the thoughts that they thought. So, I just wanted to leave you with that quote, and I think that Coolidge was entirely right by that. And just to refer you, I have created a website for myself, DaveBenner.com. Um, I'd love for you to visit. I have a blog up there in which I make constitutional entries, and I'm finishing uh, work on a book that will be made available there, and frankly, without the encouragement of many that are sitting here today, I would never have um, the ire and dedication to complete that. So thank you guys very much, and thank you for your time. <laughs> are there any questions for Dave? Yeah, there, oh yeah, there is one right away. With Warren? Lauren. Let me run the mic back in. Yeah.
I'll do my best here. Because he's got such a soft Put me on the spot. See, Dave, I was just wondering, I heard uh, some talk of a uh, convention of states. Have you heard anything about that? And what's your thoughts on that? And yeah. how, how do you think it's something that will actually happen? Yeah, um, it's been most pronounced by Mark Levin in his most recent book called The Liberty Amendments, but the idea is not really new. I do credit Levin with perhaps bringing the argument to the forefront. That book is a, is a very high seller on the New York Times bestseller list, but you know, the argue, it, it's existed in the prose of Article 5 since 1787, so um, I do, and George Mason, by the way, is the one that insisted that we have this model for the states to change the Constitution, where the federal government, if they were part of the problem, you know, we don't want them to alter the Constitution. Um, I, I do favor that. I do favor a state convention which would propose new amendments. It would not have the power to do anything more than propose amendments um, Three-fourths of the states have to agree to a, amendments before they become a actual, you know, amendment that's codified and ratified in the Constitution. I do think it's a good idea because as, you know, we've talked about here, I know Jake's mentioned it and Jack's mentioned it before, I think the federal government's irreparable from the inside. I think the states are the only ones with real recourse and reason to change, you know, the republic, so. Any idea how many like states are on board? Yeah, I mean, I, I think many states are, you know, waking up more and more to it, for sure. I mean, that book has is, is become, you know, pretty influential in, you know, hoisting this idea to the masses. But, you know, I, I don't know. I think that education is actually the key. We have to kind of teach everyone what Article 5 says. It's not going to be a matter of, well, are the states on board? I think a lot of representatives don't even know that we can be on board until they real, realize, you know, that that is a mechanism of change. We can take a couple more questions if there are any. Right back there. Here's one. Uh, I just wanted to follow up with uh, this gentleman's comments. Uh, there's actually going to be a meeting in uh, Mount Vernon this weekend to discuss this whole idea. It was championed by a state senator from Indiana who has gathered together, I think, something like representatives from 30 states that will send representatives to start the groundwork for rules for this. Conditional states have been things are happening very well. That's good. I think that's tied in a positive direction as far as I'm concerned. I know one of the you know the, the biggest arguments against it is to say that, well, this this is gonna undermine our entire government. Well, the only power that the states would have is to propose amendments. I don't see how that's you know that's subversive and that's certainly not out of line with that which George Mason and Robert uh, Roger Sherman proposed. So any other questions? We've got some time here. It looks like one of our speakers isn't right. Jake, I've got uh, a comment. Uh, David, is it nullification where we can stop stuff from coming in as well? Very important. Certainly. And, and, and the second part of this, um, what you said about we got to do it within the state, that almost tells us that we have uneducated people that we've elected. And so one of the processes of the Tea Party is to encourage people that are running for office to participate and learn within like all of us are doing sure. Yeah, I mean, I really think that a lot of more people would be open to the idea that Thomas Jefferson called the rightful remedy. You know, if you know, they're exposed to these ideas, the, the fact of it is we're just not exposed to these ideas in you know, greater society. So I welcome, you know, any group that would have me speak and I'm really glad that, you know, people can learn more about this and I'm not the only one that talks about it. I'm certainly not the authority on any issue in which I speak, but it's definitely, you know, a mechanism that, it, to allude uh, further on that, that James Madison said was necessary for arresting the progress of evil. So, the, the federal government has concocted some means to resist nullification, like in the case of Obamacare, they make the IRS the collecting entity, so it's very tough to nullify it, but, you know, we have to exude the state, the state power to try. If, if you're not the authoritative figure, is it nine judges then at the Supreme Court? I wouldn't say that's argue, uh, <laughs> that's really correct either, but I would say that the authority is really the people that should be vigilant defenders of the Constitution, learn its pros, and teach others. It. So we have one last question in the back. It's Craig the Sign Guy. All right. Dave, who is your favorite founding father and why? <laughs> uh, it, it's... <laughs> 
it's probably not a mystery to say that I feel, I'll, I'll just say my top three, but my favorite is Thomas Jefferson. I consider myself a Jeffersonian. In fact, when people ask, you know, what, are you a Republican or Democrat? I say, no, Jeffersonian. <laughs> so, I mean, they're like, what? But, you know, I agree with his views on debt and centralized banking and nullification and a humble government. So, he was a Democratic Republican, wasn't he? Well, people That's... say that, but he called his party the Republicans. And, you know, other than that, I'd say Roger Sherman and George Mason. Sherman's the most underappreciated, to be sure, but I, I call myself Jeffersonian for a reason, for that aforementioned reasons. So. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. guys. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you.